With the bar of soap he grabbed racing with a hobble out of Lusty Lulu's that night, Seamus had begun to scrub himself raw in the Mississippi River, putting sores in the most inopportune spots. He'd hurled himself into the river as if off a cliff to commit suicide. Groggy introduction to his innermost unknown carnal desires left Seamus barely capable of walking, so he limped out of Upper Town stinking of whiskey and sex, accelerating to a stumbling rush down the bluff hoping to drown in the water. He didn't drown, but did wake up Uncle Monty, who sat down to watch at the mouth of the cave, of a cave. A fire crackled in the cave, the old man on a stool next to it lighting a pipe. He dragged the pipe, roused from his sleep by panic splashing in the river just at the mouth of the cave. It did not take long for Uncle Monty to realize there was no danger, just a show. Welcome to the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour only on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, author of the Star Wars series for leftist Ghosts of Plum Run. Uh, last time we left off with a boozy threesome in St. Paul, Minnesota, where today we join Seamus Dooley, one of the boys in the threesome, for his walk of shame the morning after. Something we've all been through, haven't we? A lot is left out of history of the Civil War era, including Native Americans and the role seizure of their land played in creating the slave economy. So this project addresses that through the Métis people of Minnesota and Canada. Métis is a French word for mixed, indicating a native mother and a European father. Métis are recognized by the Canadian government as a native First Nations people with a distinct culture all their own. In Minnesota before the Civil War, Métis were integral to the Red River Trail, a, a little talked about trade route of the Pioneer West. Today, that trail lives on in the Red River Jig. A song you really should listen to a uh, shout out to a certain Canadian. You know who you are. Through Seamus, we also visit the ghost town of Nininger, Minnesota. The Panic of 1857 is also overlooked as one of the economic shocks that precipitated the Civil War, with Minnesota at the center of the collapse. Nininger was a perfect microcosm of the land speculation bubble that popped in the panic. One of my favorite YouTubers, Andrew Rakich of Atonche Films, recently did an entire video on one of Nininger's best and most shameless boosters, Ignatius Donnelly. For my book, Nininger was a good lens to view the Panic of 1857, so poor Seamus was woven into its web such that he ends up in a drunken threesome where he meets our Métis fiddler. So, let's get back to Seamus and his walk of shame. Underwater, shame of biblical Irish Catholic intensity oozed from Seamus' every pore. Coming up for air, Seamus bit off a corner of the bar of soap to wash the inside of his mouth, diving under the river to rinse, popping back up to splash the suds off his face, out of his teeth. It wasn't working. The moon seemed to mock Seamus as he tore off his clothes, throwing them to the shore, then scraping the bar of soap over his arms, his legs, his chest, his back, as far as he could reach it, the deeper spots that minutes ago were electric with life. He now wanted to kill obsessively like a madman. No bar of soap ever disappeared so fast, Seamus buzzing his fist back and forth over his skin, dunking under the water, then repeating over and over. Next were his clothes. He crawled to the shore to grind his shirt, pants, shoes, socks, everything against a rock with the same compulsion as his skin. Transfixed, Uncle Monty sat at the mouth of the cave. Uh, let's check that. Uh, I guess we're going. Okay, good. Transfixed, Uncle Monty sat at the mouth of the cave, watching a young man fall to pieces, oblivious to being watched. He was used to drunken fools in St. Paul making scenes in the middle of the night, but not like this. He is possessed by a demon, Uncle Monty whispered to himself. He saw a dollar fly out of the pants Seamus frantically lashed against a rock to cleanse himself of his demons. The dollar landed in the mud. When Seamus tore a hole in the back of his shirt, thrashing it against the rock, he snapped, fell into the mud, and just wept inconsolably. Lying on his back, naked, the moon setting, Seamus heaved tears, rolling his head back and forth in the mud, begging every saint in the books for forgiveness and intercession unto his Savior, asking the sky, what have I done? There would be no wedding, no fortune, no future. Nine years after arriving, a little boy in St. Paul, now age 17, his betrothed would never touch him now. Seamus was sure of that. 
Uncle Monty's curiosity turned to sorrow as the boy cried. The dollar settled itself into the mud. Lying in the mud, Seamus's only thoughts were of Millie Richard, St. Paul's soon-to-be star fiddler girl, daughter of fur-trapping farmer Pierre Richard, who Seamus was certain would now disown him. In 1849, Millie took pity on the newly arrived little Irish boy filled with anger, liable to throw a fist at any moment. At school or violin lessons with Seamus' Uncle Paddy, Millie figured out over time that the Irish famous famine's theft of his entire family kept his uncle, uh, except his uncle, left a scarred, shaken, scared Seamus who trusted nothing and no one unless they were Irish. <clears throat> Brawling constantly with Dakota kids, Sioux kids, Ojibwe kids, German kids, French kids, especially the ever-hated half-breeds who filled St. Paul, Seamus relied on Millie throughout to survive it. <clears throat> Unspoken trust grew between them, even though Millie herself was one of those half-breeds, her mother the product of a Sioux woman and Irish father, Millie's father nearly fully French. Somehow, across every imaginary line clashing cultures create, Millie could reach Seamus, and as a girl, this gave her pride and a sense of responsibility for this troublesome boy. Millie was the only bridge it seemed Seamus would never burn. Their marriage had been assumed for years, not just by Seamus and Millie, but by anyone who knew them. They waited for their wedding night to consummate it. His inherited Catholicism was one of the few memories Seamus could summon of his mother in Ireland. Born into imminent famine, all Seamus could remember of his mother's voice was her praying while she rocked him in her arms. When she died of hunger in the famine because she gave her own food to six-year-old Seamus for, for a solid year, the priest's prayer over her grave nailed Catholicism into Seamus permanently. Becoming a teenager in America, in a saloon town in the middle of nowhere, the temptation of waiting for Millie drove Seamus crazy with desire for her, which Millie saw and teased but didn't quite resist entirely. She felt it too. Though Catholicism coursed through the French and Irish blood of both sides of her family, Millie's world kept religion in a corner. The Native American half-breed reality of her upbringing made such things fade for Millie. She was not taught any Bible or creed, only of the great spirit and the strange oneness of humanity by her mother, and how certain things in religion were useful and certain things weren't. But since Seamus made waiting his priority, so it would be Millie's too. It would be worth the wait. And on the other side, Mr. and Mrs. Seamus Dooley would begin their journey purely. But Seamus Dooley was no match for the Panic of 1857. Few were. That spring and summer, peaking boomtown hope and ambition had St. Paul in a trance. Opportunity seemed to be in the air, raining from the sky, beginning to pry Seamus from his shell. His Uncle Patty Dooley, the town's elder fiddler, was slowly dying, and from his bed the entire spring cautioned Seamus with the wisdom of age, but Seamus could see his own life carrying forward, could imagine it, could feel Uncle Patty's pride growing at saving little Seamus from the Irish famine, carrying the boy across the sea to be an American conquering the frontier. I'll marry that girl you taught to play the fiddle, Seamus kept saying that spring to Uncle Patty. You'll see. He repeated it as Uncle Patty died in their tiny house in Uppertown. Seamus buried him content he'd sent Uncle Patty to heaven bearing good news for his mother. One day that summer of 1857, like everyone else did, and as Uncle Patty warned, Seamus did succumb to land fever, which mixed with his fever for his wedding night to send Seamus racing for his American dream. Off Seamus went to find El Dorado on the Mississippi, the town teeming with new arrivals, bouncing like a rubber ball with men in fine dress carrying leather satchels of papers that meant money, big money saloon town that St. Paul was, working at the steamboat, steamboat Landing's fuel wood supplier, Seamus couldn't avoid seeing the revelry, all manner of wickedness pouring out of the steamboats and filling the streets day and night, a Sodom and Gomorrah of golden calves parading before a sexually frustrated teenager who saw in the wealth bonanza a shortcut to that wedding night among much else. He was a sitting duck, the day a finely appointed man looking for investors passed a piece of paper under him and Seamus signed it. Just like that, Seamus owned a piece of something called, a piece of someplace called Nininger. 
named after a Mr. Nininger, who platted out the town named after himself down the river a few miles outside of St. Paul. Empire would no doubt burst from this open prairie and it would be called Nininger, making Seamus and his bride rich, comfortable, and important. There was even a map of Nininger. Everyone in St. Paul had seen it, quite elegant, exacting rows of blocks sure to burgeon into a metropolis at the top of the world, at the top of which would sit Seamus Dooley, smoking a cigar as his wife serenaded the town with her fiddle. He gave her children, a dozen maybe, and America would be his and his descendants. They would be the Dooleys of Nininger. Conjuring the dream came so easily to Seamus. Millie was astounded that summer at his transformation from deeply shy, bottled-up, short-fused Seamus to jaunty prospector, anticipating success, success with his every breath. Her violin had begun to be noticed as her father, Pierre, set up engagements in the saloons for her to play. Having spent his childhood watching Millie learn to play in Uncle Patty's lessons, Seamus was there every night that summer to listen, telling all that Millie was his betrothed, beaming with pride that he would marry the finest, most talented lady in all of Minnesota and make her a queen. Millie loved this new Seamus. She couldn't possibly understand whatever land speculation spider's web had filled Seamus with life. None could, which was the point of it all. Seamus didn't even know how his wages would pass through a piece of paper to a bank to a nicely dressed man and come back multiplied into giant piles of gold upon which his heirs would perch in a magical place called Nininger. But every penny Seamus earned that summer stacking fuel wood at the upper landing went to that very well-dressed fellow's piece of paper via the most impressive-looking bank. Millie just ignored all the talk, luxuriating in the new Seamus so much that they actually kissed once. They kissed once. The day new Seamus announced he'd be rich and then they'd wed, a clumsy but passionate first kiss erupted between them. The dam had begun to break. To fight off the urges and channel the pent-up physical energy boiling within him, Seamus worked extra hours, extra hard, extra days, sculpting himself into a frontier Adonis while his money from the effort chased the fantasy. Riches and his wedding night merged as Seamus began to see the waiting as initiation, training for consummation that night. Seamus chased what he'd spent his childhood raging against, belonging. Alas, Seamus was just a single speck in the last round of suckers born every minute in 1857, catching the whiff too late. When the panic hit in late August, Seamus spent a week trying to find the nicely dressed man who had his money, who had long since flown the proverbial coop. By the end of that week, the bank his money went into had vanished too. Nininger would not come to pass. It would forever remain a fancy map of nicely measured out tic-tac-toe blocks. Men raced around St. Paul gripping the pieces of paper they'd signed, guaranteeing them a piece of a variety of Nininger's all over the par prairie, waving their paper in the air to prove they were still tycoons in utero. Fewer and fewer people came off the riverboats, while more and more people boarded them to leave town. Nearly every bank in St. Paul collapsed. Cash stopped circulating if any was seen. Counties printed their own script for currency just to circulate something, anything. St. Paul began to empty out. The heady euphoria of boomtown excess transformed overnight into woeful clamor and desperation. Seamus frantically running around town, grasping at vapors that were never there in the first place. No, he kept saying to himself, no, no, this isn't happening. A new trance of fear seized Seamus and the rest whose previous and only fear was missing out on the biggest deals of their lives. Now they feared everything else. They all disappeared into their new trance from their loved ones, chasing themselves down a spiral of regret as the bubble popped. Millie wondered where Seamus had gone, but knew, in the back of her mind, new Seamus had yielded to old Seamus. Her parents knew, too. At home on the farm, Millie's parents kept up appearances for her sake, the farm's routines repeating as usual, no fuss, the previously assumed marriage suddenly evaporated from conversation, as families do when tragedy strikes. Better not to speak of it. The panic had little effect on a subsistence farming family like the Richards. Millie's take from playing violin in saloons was nearly as resistant to collapse as farming. The booze business, another immune fact of life, which was about to balloon with the man from sorrows drowning in it. And whoever was left in town still wanted music with their booze more than ever. As days became weeks without him, 
Millie kept her eyes open for Seamus at her little saloon gigs. Her repertoire became increasingly Irish laments, hoping he'd walk in. After the second week of Seamus gone, Millie's crowds teared up more than they danced to her music. All the lessons from Uncle Patty, the classical pieces, the Vivaldi, the Schubert, where her talent really soared, got put away. The Irish lullaby her mother sang her to sleep with as a baby would end her performance for the night. Not a dry eye in the house, including her own. Seamus dragged from one saloon to another for nearly a month. Only the Irish ones. St. Paul's staple. He couldn't face her. Not now. No, he would only see Millie again once all this was put right. They would be na- they would be married properly or not at all. Each day he'd shake off a hangover to rattle the trees for a piece of his dream to fall out and chase down. Each night, Seamus found the bottom of a whiskey bottle or two. Weeks of his own foolishness being rubbed into his face, Seamus found himself at the bar of Henry Shearn's Headquarters 2 Oyster Shack when he knew Millie wasn't playing there that night. The Métis fiddler in the corner, just another half-breed insult added to his injury. Seamus' gloom was pierced by the glance down the bar from an impossibly handsome boy whose stare coursed through him like a hot knife through butter. Something had stirred. He was only supposed to think women attractive, Seamus scolded to himself in that split second. But the booze did its magic, and instantly Seamus was an animal of desire. Wedding night be damned, the two boys' eyes locked into each other across the bar. He caught himself, looked away, took another shot from the bottle next to him, uh, which we'll do right now, and said to himself, Get thee behind me, Satan, he said with a slam of the shot glass on the bar. He had erased the moment from his mind only a while when Betty Posey came from behind to whisper in his ear, There's a dollar in it if you'll join my friend and I next door, handsome. He turned to see Betty's alluring temptation, then to look again at the bar down the at the boy down the bar. His wedding night would be damned indeed. Caution cast to the wind, Seamus barreled into his own unknown. Hours later, as he wailed at the stars lying on his back, layer upon layer of shame pressing him deeper into the mud of the Mississippi like sediment, Seamus remembered about the dollar. He sprung out of the mud to wander drunken sword to his soaked pants lying there to rummage the pockets. At least the dollar is a new start, he told himself, like a prayer. At least I sold my soul to the devil for good money, and I didn't hand it to Satan in sin. That would mean it didn't feel good, that he hadn't broken his pledge to his betrothed, that his wedding night remained to be experienced fully in purity, and this dollar would start his road back to it. But Seamus couldn't find the dollar. Uncle Monty watched from inside the cave as Seamus scraped at the mud with his fingernails to look for the dollar. Inside him, the stranger's boy's eyes again stared into his, in that bed, filling Seamus, driving his hands deeper into the mud. In that bed at Lusty Lulu's, they looked right through each other, into each other, onto each other. Every time Seamus saw that stranger boy look at him to kiss him, tension simmered to explosions, consuming them both. The thought of their bodies against each other made Seamus shiver in the mud, hoping to forget it somehow. Betty Posey was barely noticed in that bed. Maybe she took Seamus's virginity. Maybe that boy did. Maybe it was all a dream, this drunken dream in this mud. But her dollar called to Seamus, across the mud, back into the river. Gasping in a deep breath, he dove to the riverbed to feel around in the pitch black for something that felt like paper. He swam around in case it had floated somewhere, splashing frantically this way and that. He swam and swam. As dawn began to break, Seamus broke with it drunk and exhausted from from weeping swimming washing thrashing searching hoping losing begging for mercy from above he collapsed in tears then sleep uncle monty watched the entire desperate passion play splashing across the river until seamus collapsed into a dream naked uncle monty took pity carrying his own buffalo skin blanket from the cave to seamus to keep him warm when you wake up uncle monty's got your dollar said a voice a buffalo skin blanket dropping onto Seamus Dooley lying naked in the mud of the Mississippi River shore. Was this part of the dream? Seamus reached, grabbed. No, it was a real buffalo skin. His eyes cracked open. Stars crowded the pre-dawn sky above him. A short, stumpy old man walked away, a wide-brimmed hat silhouetted by the field of stars. 
Like a child, Seamus pulled the blanket up over his head, then swirls of light spiraled behind his eyelids, dazed again, wondering, then finally fell asleep. Uncle Monty crawled back into his makeshift bed and said to himself, Well, maybe this is the last time I sleep in this cave. So, we're going to break there. Um, The cave in uh, the riverbed uh, uh, next to the Mississippi River um, is in there because uh, St. Paul was sort of started by people running saloons out of caves. (laughs) And it was originally called Pig's Eye by a man uh, who was called Pig's Eye, who had one eye um, and ran a saloon out of a cave. Um, And uh, when you're writing a story like this, you kind of have to weave all these little bits and pieces in and out of each other so the story works. Um, And that's how we got to a cave. That's how we got to Uncle Monty. Um, So what we're going to do now is we're going to discuss the um, Métis people and how they came uh, to be, and how Uncle Monty got into this story. So let's get back to Uncle Monty. Born Montcalm Duchamp, north of the border in Canada, to a French Ojibwe father and an Ojibwe mother, his people were called Métis, or mixed. Complicating the mishmash, Uncle Monty's French father insisted on speaking only English, because that's who bought the furs, who trapped far from his, he trapped far from home most of the year. Raised mostly by his mother's Ojibwe family, the paradox of his split Métis origins was a constant presence in Little Monty's every breath, a reality to navigate daily. Shumi is what the grandkids called Little Monty's maternal grandfather, a shortened, clumsily English-sounding version of the Ojibwe word for grandfather, easier for kids to say who were learning many languages from birth. An Ojibwe elder by the time Little Monty was born, Shumi had succumbed to the white man's liquor poison long before Little Monty's French fur trapper father met Shumi's only daughter. Shumi wasn't lost to the bottle, like so many Ojibwe, just captured by it. Thus, it was hard to pinpoint Shumi's ancestry exactly. Sometimes, in Shumi's tall tales, he was pure Ojibwe. Other times, there was a Frenchman or Irishman deep in the mists of the family tree. But Shumi raised Uncle Monty's mother as pure Ojibwe, and she passed as much of it along to Uncle Monty as she could. It didn't occur to little Monty that Shumi was a drunkard. Shumi was just fun for a kid, always horsing around, laughing, playful, and singing when he was awake. Little Monty would fall asleep on passed out Shumi, waiting for him to wake up so they could play some more. Just why Shumi was always falling asleep was not important to a little boy who just wanted to play. Their ancestry split half a dozen ways. Métis became their own people, clinging to the land like Ojibwe, cast adrift to assimilate assimilate cultures of European relatives they'd never met, spread across a borderline drawn with a pencil by a lord or duke in some palace's drawing room in London. Imperial colonialism placed the Hudson's Bay Company as lord over anyone's existence in the fur-trapping regions of the Red River, including the whiskey English settlers used to trade with unsuspecting Ojibwe. Some traders abhorred the practice, Puritan temperance style, knowing it left their trading partners incapable, weakening their resolve in the wilderness, slithering into their culture to destroy it. The Hudson's Bay Company, however, was not bothered. Whatever brought a lower price was useful. And copious liquor certainly did that. Well, well before Little Monty was born, Shumi became wise enough to this game to see the writing on the wall, telling him the white man cometh to take it away. And their whiskey was a balm on the many wounds, one being the stump on his right hand. Shumi was missing a thumb, chopped off by a fur trap. All assumed it was because of the drink, the scar of a stump, a constant reminder of so much. So... A deep sadness in Shumi became apparent to little Monty as he grew up. The playfulness of his grandfather meant to mask the melancholy. Little Monty's mother accepted her father's whiskey habits, knowing she could do nothing about it, so she reveled in her father's close relationship with her son, his, his grandson. She taught her boy to love his Shumi and never wonder about the drink. During the annual autumn buffalo hunt, Shumi insisted it playing his role as an elder, despite not being very capable of it. He passed to his daughter a recipe for pemmican, 
dried buffalo meat mixed with berries and fat that could last for years in a log to be sliced into patties when needed. Out on the prairie during the hunt, about all Shumi could manage was preparing the pemmican. When Shumi inevitably wandered away from the hunt's ceremony so inebriated all he could do was sing, it fell to little Monty to be Shumi's company as the hunt's rhythms carried on without him. Shumi bounced little Monty on his knee, singing himself to sleep. Like his mother's pemmican recipe, music thus connected grandson to grandfather from the start. When a new country forged a border across the 49th... Went, <laughs> let's start that over again with another drink. When a new country, America, forged a border across the 49th parallel right through Métis land, the fur trade began to go south down the river, down the Red River, to avoid the Hudson's Bay Company monopoly in British Canada. Rising from the prairie in about 1812... The Red River Trail brought furs south from the Canadian border to the little landing near Fort Snelling called Pig's Eye, and goods went north from Pig's Eye back to the, to the border. The 600-mile network of trails through the prairie took six weeks to travel, every inch of it by foot, next to an ox pulling a cart with furs. They made one round trip each year. Shumi was one of the first Métis on the new trail to escape it all. Walking for six weeks southward, then another six weeks north, Shumi felt relief in the solitude of the plains. Red River tr the Red River, tr River Trail became a part of him as it became a part of every Métis thereafter. Little Monty's first trip south to Pig's Eye, about age six or seven, he couldn't remember, he rode on a Red River cart pulled by an ox driven by his Shumi, specifically designed for the trail. Red River carts had no metal, only wood, so grease wouldn't catch trail dust and destroy the wheel, and so the cart could be repaired with any tree felled on the trail the eight or twelve times its axle broke on a round trip. Thus, Red River carts squeaked incessantly with every turn of the wooden axle in the wooden wheel. With more than a hundred carts in a train, the squeaks could be heard for miles. Shumi bartered for a fiddle so little Monty could learn to play music along the way, if only to cover the noise a drunkard like Shumi couldn't handle. Little Monty quickly mastered the Métis songs, a rousing combination of French and Irish folk tunes mixed with native rhythms meant for joy. This, is the, this part is for our, our, the Canadian You Know Who You Are. the music part the irregular bouncing of the cart put a crooked rhythm into every metis fiddle a jig of its own quite different from french or irish irish music a crowd could dance for 20 minutes to just one metis jig the ox cart bobbed and swayed oddly under under little monty practicing on top giving little monty's fiddle a peculiar crooked rhythm kick keeping the ox carts teams entertained as they sailed the seamless prairie like a ship's captain would sail the endless sea. They navigated by barely visible landmarks in the undulating landscape, no perceivable rise much bigger than any other, but nothing but grassland to the horizons except for ruts beginning to be dug into the land where hundreds of carts pass twice a year. On good days, the trail presented a heavenly paradise of flowing prairie, earth, and sky, the only two colors anyone saw, both changing constantly. On bad days, soggy ground broke the carts, their wheels, their axle, axles, thunderclouds would tower over the cart train, or swarms of mosquitoes would turn even the oxen into cowards. Most days, the trail was a mix of it all, and at night, little Monty would help the old timers set up camp and sit with his fiddle to play them all to sleep. Once the fur convoys made it to Pig's Eye, they'd rest for a couple weeks, filling their carts in town or at Fort Snelling with manufactured goods to take back to Canada by the end of summer in time for the annual autumn buffalo hunt. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see, where are we? Um, most Red River Trail carters stayed those weeks in fields north of town disgusted with the town's ever more whiskey-soaked population of invading immigrants, never wishing to be among them. Not Little Monty, it was Shumi who found this cave during a summer stay in St. Paul, which was Pig's Eye at the time, deciding it was cooler than staying on the plains north of town. Little Monty loved the cave. 
each summer giddy with excited anticipation for the short stay there with his Shumi, just to hear the echo of his fiddle in its walls. Shumi would sing with little Monty's fiddle in the cave until drinking himself to sleep. The cave was their secret, a grandfather with his grandson, for a few precious years of childhood which were all too few. One summer return journey northward, Shumi died on the prairie, just keeling over, leaving little Monty with memories, music, and the cave. He became Uncle Monty by decision of his fellow trail carters, still staying in the cave each summer as pig's eye grew into St. Paul, the cave's entrance less of a secret every year. Without his Shumi, Uncle Monty's two weeks in St. Paul every year changed. He got into a routine earning extra money playing the Métis songs on his fiddle in the saloon circuit, leaving his ox cart up in the fields, staying in the cave. His trip down from Canada in summer of 1857 was Uncle Monty's 40th and his last. His body growing old, nostalgia overtook Uncle Monty in 1857. By the time Seamus swam to its shore, the cave was just a place Uncle Monty would visit to remind him of his shumi. The trip south that summer was too much. Normally, Uncle Monty drove four ox carts on the trail. In 1857, he took only one. When the train's 150 ox carts curled up in camp on the prairie, Uncle Monty played the fiddle less and less. After each day's walk on the trail, Uncle Monty would ease himself to the ground at the campfire, the rest of the ox cart train leaving him be, beginning to care for him like an elder, like he cared for his shumi. He forced himself through the rest of the trail, worrying over each step beside his ox cart, knowing one turned ankle could leave him a cripple. Each night, a series of aches and pains consumed Uncle Monty. Each day, the Red River Trail's cruelty multiplied as if to prove to an old man this was no place for him. The squeaks from the ox carts grew louder in his ears, less comforting accompaniment to his fiddle than unceasing grinding noise. Crossing streams and a a necessary, sometimes daily, test of a carter's handyman speed now bedeviled Uncle Monty, such that others had to help him disassemble his cart and put it back together as a boat floating on its upturned wheels. Mercifully, the axle on Uncle Monty's cart only broke once in the last three weeks of the 1857 trip south. Someone else fixed it for him. A new respect for the trail grew in Uncle Monty, in awe for those who walked it before him, for himself for enduring it for decades, for four decades, and for his shoe As luck would have it, the 1857 ox cart train arrived in St. Paul just before the panic popped the bubble. So Uncle Monty sold his ox cart of furs at the very top of the frontier boom. Instead of then buying goods to fill his ox cart for the trip north, Uncle Monty sold his ox cart to another carter, deciding to stay the autumn and winter to recover. Home was up north and he'd return some day. He had, he had no wife or, nor children. His parents had joined Shumi above long ago. There was no rush. Uncle Monty would miss the annual fall buffalo hunt, but for now, rest was all that mattered. He took a room in a boarding house in Uppertown as soon as he could, where Uncle Monty relaxed finally for a full month. Two weeks into his rest, Uncle Monty felt better enough to play the ox cart train out of town with his fiddle as it crawled by the boarding house loaded with goods back to the trail. Every passing carter waved farewell up at Uncle Monty in his second floor window until they'd see him again next summer. After a few more weeks, Uncle Monty was well enough to return to the saloon circuit with his fiddle, the routine of daily rest bringing him slowly back to himself. When the August panic hit, Uncle Monty visited his grandfather's riverside cave more often, a chill from the back of the cave revealing it was no longer his family's secrets. Deep inside the cave's unseen caverns and tunnels, Uncle Monty discovered dozens of barrels surrounded by ice blocks. A German brewer had figured out there was no better way to keep his Bavarian lager fresh than in caves. Christoph Stolman bought his, brought his family to St. Paul from Iowa. In 1855, a Bavarian immigrant whose cave beer would soon become Minnesota's largest brewery. Stallman named his lager after the caverns where barrels of it piled up. Digging a network of caves under the town, hauling massive chunks of ice off the Mississippi River in winter into the cave. Since he'd only been in this cave in summers until 1857, Stallman's brewery moving in was news to Uncle Monty. So he made friends with the Germans who kept their lager cool in the caves, and they introduced Uncle Monty's fiddle to the saloon selling their beer. Time was transforming St. Paul, the Red River Trail, and Uncle Monty's world. 
Uncle Monty looked up at the dollar, drying on a line in the cave above the fire, then at the boy under his buffalo skin on the riverbank. So he reached for his fiddle. This one's for you, Shumi, Uncle Monty whispered upward. He began to play an Irish lullaby as Seamus dreamed under the buffalo skin. Peace, fire, Seamus sailed the sea of prairie grass up and down endlessly, then fire raced out of the horizon, turning to towering thunderclouds, bursting lightning, then belching, blistering billows of blizzard snow, which turned to mosquitoes, then blank, then the sea of grass, and it all began again, the peace, then the fire, the storms, the snow, the insects, then the peace. Between heaven and hell, Seamus floated in sleep on a bouncing ox cart as a fiddle played. The Irish lullaby woke Seamus under the buffalo skin. Uncle Monty put down the fiddle, picked the boy's dollar and clothes off the line he'd hung them on to dry, and walked over to toss Seamus' clothes at him, putting the dollar in his pocket. I've got your dollar. You can call me Uncle Monty. Old Seamus, his hatred of half-breeds, crashed into another new Seamus. Seeing one of those half breeds taking care of him, lying naked under the half breed's own buffalo skin. Were you? Seamus began to ask. Uncle Monty interrupted. Shh. In slow motion, Uncle Monty bent over the boy, shushing the sun behind him, causing Seamus to squint. From the ground, Seamus stared at the old fellow. Silhouetted against a blue sky now, Uncle Monty seemed to float above Seamus. It was time to keep his mouth shut put aside, for now, his hatred of this half-breed hovering over him like a vision. He had kept Seamus warm with his own buffalo skin and found his dollar, so Seamus grabbed his clothes and began to dress under the blanket on the ground. I'm sorry, Seamus began. Never mind what sort of night you had, Uncle Monty cautioned in his gravelly voice. It's another day. You just floated on in here last night, Uncle Monty said, walking back to the cave. Got a name? Seamus, he answered quickly. Uncle Monty smiled at the sound of it, so similar to his shoomy. The the hangover gripped Seamus in such a haze, he barely heard himself talk over the ringing in his head. Breakfast here if you're hungry, Uncle Monty announced. He reached into a bag, and out came a slab of pemmican. While Seamus finished getting dressed under the buffalo skin, Uncle Monty sliced off a patty of the pemmican, then tossed it into a pan over the fire with a sizzle. The aroma drew Seamus to the cave, where he sat down next to to Uncle Monty's campfire and devoured the pemmican. This is delicious, Seamus declared. My mother's recipe, Uncle Monty replied, pouring a coffee. You have some coffee, I'll get your dollar, he said. Standing up to walk to the back of the cave, he disappeared into the blackness. Seamus was left alone at the fire. His empty stomach now full, Seamus thought of Millie. Why didn't he just go back to Millie's farm, marry her there, and forget about all these dreams? Why did he chase fantasies? All these phantoms landed him in a half-breed's cave looking for a dollar he lost in the river. I should just go to Millie's father's farm, he thought again and again. But I can't now, not after that. My God, what have I done? Windmills turned in his pounding head as he waited for Uncle Monty to bring him his dollar. Footsteps scraped the ground from deep in the back of the cave. From the fireside, Seamus peered into the black as the steps approached. Am I dreaming again? Someone wants to meet you, Seamus, Uncle Monty's voice echoed. As a tall, hulking man appeared out of the back of the cave, wearing an apron and holding a notebook. I'm told you can drive a team of horses, the tall man asked as Uncle Monty approached Seamus with the dollar in his hand. Here's your dollar, Uncle Monty said. This is Mr. Stallman. He owns a brewery above this cave. Confused, Seamus stood to shake Stallman's hand. Seamus, Monty tells me, Stallman asked. Yes, sir, Seamus replied, wondering what he'd gotten himself into now. Uncle Monty busied himself with cleaning up his Shumi's cave for the last time. Mr. Stallman has a delivery of barrels to St. Cloud that needs a drayman, Uncle Monty said, turning to Stallman with a grin, and has been very persistent asking me to take it for him. But I'm far too old for these days. A drayman, a drayman drove the beer wagon with a team of horses and barrels for delivery. Between St. Paul and St. Cloud were 65 miles of the Red River Trail along the Mississippi River. The journey of several days each way was a young man's job. Come, I'll show you, Stallman said, putting on an arm around Seamus. All the draymen seemed to keep leaving town. Escort, <laughs> escorting Seamus into the barrel caverns, Stallman pointed this way and that, explaining the Bavarian way of brewing lager, the importance of keeping it cold, 
Shame is chilled by the strangeness of ice blocks underground in late summer. Amazed by the sheer number of barrels lining endless passageways, Uncle Monty followed behind them, satisfied his morning at his grandfather's old cave, would turn out well for everyone. We've got the wagon and horses, just need a drayman, Stallman said to Seamus. All this panic is emptying St. Paul of men who can drive horses, and the steamboats aren't going up the river as often these days. Before the snow falls, there's at least a few trips to make. Old Monty here keeps turning me down, but logger waits for no man. I I don't know what to say, Seamus said. Unsure of anything, Seamus thought it over. Maybe he needed a few days on a wagon alone with himself. Maybe this was a ticket to another fortune, after which he'd never have to rely on the charity of any half-breeds or Germans ever again. Maybe after an autumn and winter of this, he could return to Millie. When it was all settled, Seamus was the cave brewery's new drayman to St. Cloud, handshakes all around, and he turned to Uncle Monty in amazement. How can I thank you, Seamus asked. Uncle Monty thought of his shoemy on the day he would leave his grandfather's cave behind. Time was changing his world so fast, Uncle Monty was just happy to help someone out and keep filling his body with rest. On the cave's floor, a cat appeared from between beer barrels, circling the cave floor in the dust collected in, between, in clumps between the barrels. Come hear me play sometime. That will do nicely, Uncle Monty replied. He caught sight of the cat, bending to pick it up. Looking into its eyes, Uncle Monty smiled at the cat, then blew a puff into the cat's face, who purred. Then he put the cat back on the cave floor, saying to the cat, Go now. And that's the end of chapter 7. Uh, and you are introduced to our cat, which is one of my uh, devices in the book, uh, which you have to learn about yourself. Uh, thank you for joining the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, author of the Star Wars series for leftist Ghosts of Plum Run. Uh, next chapter is chapter 8. Uh and uh, chapter eight is going to be um, agreeable rest back in Uniontown with the regiment in 1863. Uh, as a reminder, we also have uh, coming up Tom Schroeder, the owner of Waldman's Brewery, which is a uh, the oldest remaining commercial building in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, and where a lot of the action takes place in our story. We will see you next time. Thanks.